you can hit me at the back. I guess it's fine. Okay. So um, my name is Martin. Um, I work now at a local company. Um, basically, I've been there for four, four months, and it's involved setting up a whole system. And basically, there's been a bunch of choices I've had to make, um, mainly involved. And you'll see why there's a bunch of interesting choices. Um, this is the local company. It's called Handshakes. Their kind of mission is to build a graph of all the people and entities in Singapore and all the relationships between them. So this is who owns what, who's married to whom, where did they go to college, who's a subsidiary, what M&A did they do. And they do this by looking, by reading all of the PDFs produced by all of the companies and manually entering everything they find. Now, this is a, a huge task. Um, and basically, you can see down in the, the, the bottom of the slide, they produce a, like a graph of this stuff. And so their customers are kind of law firms, or could be hedge funds, investment people, or the regulators themselves, who want to kind of dig into companies and spot problems. Um, but this is a manual process, and that's not optimal, particularly since they want to now go to Hong Kong, do, do other markets, so which are much bigger. Um, so my job, or the project, is about increasing productivity so that it's not all done by hand. Um, it's a big natural language processing thing. Uh, basically, we'll have a machine reading all of these PDFs, extracting the entities and relationships, and then having a kind of a second level of an analyst saying, am I on the right track? And then the machine can go back and revise the estimates. For so we've got both nine and 18 month milestones. The low head count is me. But there should be more, so I mean, that's, that's a, there's, there's another um, excellent thing. So we're also building this a kind of on a, a Watson-style mini experts in that instead of having one big machine learning system, which kind of, if you fix one piece, it will get worse at something else. It tends to happen. Academically, you want to build one know-it-all system, but what the IBM people discovered was if you have a bunch of little experts at the different subjects, you can train them independently and achieve an overall higher score. So that, that's how it's doing. Um, and this is going to have an internal customer, which is the company, but also for the 18-month thing, an external customer who uh, have, or I mean, there are lots of people who want to read unstructured documents and extract good data. Um, so in, in building this system, um, I wanted to be developer friendly because that otherwise I'd be shooting myself in the head. Um, I also wanted to be language agnostic because um, Python is where a lot of the good libraries are. In particular, there's a thing called Theano where I can then start to use GPUs, very good for um, machine learning stuff. On the other hand, it needs to be kind of interactive, it, there needs to be lots of communication. Um, the Node stuff is much better at async stuff than Python will ever be. So. Um, I also wanted to be maintainable, so I didn't want to go into esoteric stuff, which I've been playing with. So probably no Go, no Scala, no Haskell here. Um, and in fact, the, when when they the, they have a te they have tech people in Thailand, when I reassured them there's going to be JavaScript, there's going to be some Python, maybe they, they were very happy about that. So that's good. The also the other thing is there's no need for web scale. I mean, we're not doing anything fancy with databases here. Um, or scaling out. It, it's very much con making a database which is probably a few gigabytes in size. Um, it's not terabytes or a duping or anything. Um, so day one, I thought it was clear from the outset that I'm a Linux person, but anyway. So th they're, a, they're a, a Windows place. They consider it Windows Enterprise. So there's a bit of a, a positioning on day one, particularly since they hadn't actually seen any kind of output from me at the time. Um, so the, the compromise was to have a big Windows server, which they considered heavy duty, um, and they can run their MS SQL in that, they can run a Git server in that, I'm perfectly well. They're also running a very nice Microsoft Hyper-V hypervisor, which basically is an entire machine, apart from this other little piece. So anyway, it was presented one way, but the reality is um, we've got a very large Linux playground for me to play in, and everyone's happy. Um, so the component box, these are the different bits when you're building a, a decent sized system, I wanted to deal with configuration, because um, I wanted that to be consistent across all the different systems. 
well, down there we get to microservices, so this is why it would, it would turn out this way. Um, there'd be a nice web front end, which would be used by a bunch of analysts. They've got 20 people in Singapore, like 20 people outside of Singapore, um, doing, I would say, um, back-breaking, mundane kind of work, highlighting stuff in uh, Adobe Reader, and dragging it into a, a little web, a little database front end and pressing the enter key is, is not terrible. Um, so I can improve that, that's good. Um, the, there's a database, I don't want to interact with that database much because it's in Microsoft. Um, so this is one of, well, one of the microservices is to essentially abstract that away into just a data source. Um, the microservices is because everything's got to communicate with each other and I also want to be able to essentially let other people build a service and just integrate with it and then and so, so we're not all get, getting in each other's way. Um, documentation, I, that was a priority for me because I want to be able to hand this over to someone and then there's a bunch of other as well. Um, configuration, so I want to be language agnostic. Everything has to be able to read this configuration format. Uh, why don't I use JSON, which would be an obvious one. Um, because you have to keep quoting stuff, you need lots of brackets, you default to comment, and then there's these stupid comma things, which I quite like to just add things to lists. And deleting the comma at the end irritates me. Um, YAML is a, is a more Python-esque kind of thing. Um, it's a kind of a white, white space um, dependent layout. On the other hand, there's nice tooling, and in particular, there's a node YAML config, um, which means you can do a configuration like this. And what, what's going on here is that this is just one file, um, and there, this file is actually longer because each service has its own piece. Um, this is saying that under the default thing, which the environment is the default is to, to, to production, there's a service called Ground Truth, and the Ground Truth server has this, this and that host and port, and you know various uh, database strings or, or whatever parameters. But then, if you're in a production environment, that then down below, the production thing will then overwrite whatever parameters it wants to, so that the production port will actually turn into 3072. Um, there'll be various other things. So if I have different environments, there'll be development one, where I don't want to keep loading up big data sets, I'll choose different, different data sets, or a testing thing which I want to be able to run concurrently. We can fix, fix all that pretty easily. And of course, there's a nice Python module for reading this in. You can read it wherever. It all turns into beautifully same everywhere. So web server, I'm not inventing any, any new stuff here. This is bootstrap, we picked a nice theme, done. Okay. Um, apologies to all the designers, but they work really well. Um, Node, Express, and Jade, which is kind of nice. Socket IO, PDF2AS. So Jade is something essentially coming out of the Ruby style um, Hamel thing. It's really convenient. If you're, if you're as irritated as I am at commas and closing brackets, then you're kind of like the idea of indentation implies structure. Um, and this turns, there are tools just to turn HTML into nice documents like this. It makes you know, editing them almost a pleasure. Um, Socket IO is another choice whereby um, I knew that I needed some feedback interactivity with the web pages. In particular, what I'd like to do is have, as results, the mach machine decides on results, there should be like a stream of hypotheses and that the user can interact with it. Um, doing that with jQuery turns into kind of like a hell. Because jQuery, I mean, at the beginning it seems like, oh, I'll do a query, I'll get results, but then suddenly you start to have different branching possibilities and turn into something really unpleasant. Socket IO, basically you get, you get a message bus um, this shows you can construct a socket on the server server side, and then just connect these. And this, this in, it also, like Express, you can add in middleware to do authentication. Um, you can then receive these queries and send back along this socket. The clients can connect and reconnect, whatever. It's all very flexible and beautiful. PDF.js. This is an, a thing out of the Mozilla guide. Um, and it's how PDFs are displayed in Firefox. Um, but you can also embed it in a web page and then manipulate it using controls. You have to kind of fiddle with some of the, the source or whatever. But this, I, I did this fairly early on, but kind of demonstrated that 
the whole PDF process that they were doing could be replaced by something which is all embedded in a web browser. And if you clicked on one side, it would highlight in the document. And they were blown away by this idea. So, so that, that was a win. Um, but also, this will be important in the, the later thing. It's, it's nice to know that PDFs are completely understood by this web um, database. So um, MSSQL, I prefer not to deal with this. Um, so this is a bridge into the other side of my, the big server. Um, one other thing is that because of the, I've got a testing regime which is being imposed on me by the, for machine learning purposes in that I have a before state of, of the database, I get a new document and I then find out what the actual analyst would have said. So I have two snapshots. But I also want to control who gets, I don't want lots of my components being able to query the after state. You need to keep very vigorous control of that. So I wanted to produce a kind of a service which only allowed one view of it, and then I can kind of firewall off the the, the, the after states to just a, a verification kind of service. Um, and there's also the, I actually did all this. This stuff is all in JavaScript um, because I wanted it to all be nice and concurrent. They could be long queries. Um, it's very performant, um, and it also does some interesting. Kind of Scoring, so I, I basically I, I take their database and I cache it, um, and I also break it down into kind of an information theoretic score. So that if I've got a word, for instance, I, I'm searching here for Louis Coquelin, who is some person, um, and this is just a you know it's an, just a, uh, a rest query, um, and it's giving back a series of names, which would be Louis Coquelin happens to score twenty points, whatever. And the next will be Wu Cochrane, okay, who's scoring less. And I can actually measure the, the information content of each name based upon the rarity of each word. And all of this, by caching the whole thing, I can do these very fast scores. And it turns into something which I know that they can't do. This is another win. They can't do this on, on their, um, with any ease on the Microsoft. Um, Microsoft, so, so I, I started, but this is it's all going to be REST APIs. My initial idea was I wanted some sort of zero MQ or nano message um, because this is high performance for the internal stuff. Um, but the request response thing isn't quite there in terms of concurrency for Node. It will work if you put lots of different processes on the same socket, but it won't do a nice thing like an Express will do. So as a Fallback, I've, I chose a thing called Happy, which is for REST APIs. Um, beyond, so so the, it's, it's kind of a simplified, it's a simplified express. This is, so, so none of these are going to be exposed to the outside world. This is an internal thing. Um, I've got stuff for launching these in System D, um, which happens to be in the box. Um, and then I've also got a thing whereby the different services can be placed on different servers. So I want to be able to cope with that without um, hurting myself because I have a development machine and I want them services on the production machine to run. I don't want to have to bring up an entire production machine on my, my laptop because that will get crazy. So, so happy. Happy is quite happy making. Um, you make a quick server, you create a route, and then it, you just handle, handle it home to some, like the, response and, the request and response. What I wanted to do, though, is, is in the main app.js kind of file, I wanted to put all of the, the route handlers without any of the request stuff, because I wanted to divide out the requests and hand them over cleanly to the back end. The response thing is fine, but I didn't want the response kind of digging through the request in any detail, in particular, because I want to document this file extensively. It makes sense to do all of the <coughs> handling of the requests in this before I launch out into the, the route. Um, system D. So this is a, a Linuxism um, that was painful, but it's actually pretty nice. Um, how to launch this thing so it all starts up. It's, it's also beautiful because it will restart these services. Um, it actually handles things pretty well compared to, I was kind of dreading it, but it's it actually pretty, pretty nice. Um, one, one minor quirk is I actually put a I actually embellish my command line so that when I look at my processes, I can see exactly what's running and what's not, because otherwise it's just like node, 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 node. Uh, 
um, poor man's mesh. So on this, using a host file, you can because the way it's uh, parsed, you can just say, I want this one to resolve onto my laptop. I'll have all the others resolve onto my host or <coughs> onto my production machine, and then just by, for for development purposes, I can run the heavy duty stuff as long as it's uh, consistent. Then it's all going to be fine. So this is poor man's way of doing it. Um, documentation. So I wanted to put the documentation in the source because otherwise I would never write it. Um, I like Python's Sphinx, which is it's kind of well tested and also kind of easy to use. I find the kind of the Java docs it's just just a hairy use. I mean, I don't understand the, the class. Whatever it's, it doesn't naturally flow for me. So. Um, I've also, added, to this, I've added some specific things so I can document API as well in JavaScript and Python. Um, but once you do that, this is a very simple documentation interface. Basically, you can just pretty up your code with, with this um, kind of syntax so it understands different um, kinds of source and uh, response kind of things. And then at the end of that, you'll get out you're, you must have seen these Python Sphinx generated pages. It all links together nicely. It looks kind of beautiful. Um, but also, if you press the other button, then you get a, a latex PDF coming out, which is for, for the, the management. This is a great doc, you know, a thick document to hold, and, and that's, that satisfies that. Um, um, other. So. Other things I wanted to do is have a kind of message bus so that everything can kind of understand where, what, how everything is being processed. And Nano Message works pretty well for that. It has solid pub sub kind of thing, kind of the, mit, the kind of the internal version of a socket I, I have. Um, I wanted to do caching because every little service can cache whatever it wants to, and various other async. So you want promises, promises. Probably is a bluebird is a good thing. The promises are coming for real, are here for real. Um, and testing, which in incredibly, the company's developers don't have a testing regime. So they're, they're amazed that I can do this. Um, so this is a, what Nano Message looks like. This is like a zero MQ. It is like a, a messaging protocol. It's very close to, to the silicon as opposed to being a big, elaborate um, thing. Um, basically, it allows you to create a socket which you can publish on. And this thing is just like, this, this little code snippet is just sending out messages. Then on the bottom, there's a subscriber listening. But you can have, this thing will allow you to have 10,000 subscribers in a problem, 100,000 subscribers in a problem. Um, I'm probably going to have three subscribers, but this is, a, this is the right thing to do, so I'll do that. Um, <clears throat> caching. So his, his promises, basically with callbacks, um, you can imagine that the first thing you're doing is, suppose I wanted to, to read a file and the file's not there, then your callback will say, okay, go and read it, now I need to, to cope with it. Promises are very nice because I can just fail, resume, and then res tie back into you know, with my kind of promise thing. It turns into a very nice solution promises everywhere. So. Testing, um, basically Mocha with, I think it's a browser, a zombie browser, it's, quite, uh, here. it's working very, very well for me. Um, I'm not doing unit testing, since I, that would be too much. I mean, the moment that the code is evolving very, very quickly, but what I do care about is end-to-end -end testing on some of the use cases or from external APIs that it's, that you know, the, the database didn't break, for instance, or that the users still can log in. So this is very good for just for making sure I haven't completely destroyed everything. Um, I think that's probably about all of the other. So there's there's a lot of choices um, out there, um, and just spending the time to understand the trade-offs is very worth worthwhile, I think. Um, but now there's also the real work of doing the actual machine learning. So while doing all of this, I'd be kind of plugging away of making stuff which works sufficient to keep the, the, the company entertained um, with, with positive action. But there's, you know, you also have to make sure the infrastructure is all right because later on they'll say, oh, good job we did that. And uh, anyway, now we're on to the real world. <coughs> so, 
questions? Oh yes, I should say, we are looking for a keen Singaporean. So if there are Singaporeans in the audience, we, we have a particular need for someone who's keen and, and really different from many places hiring here. Um, we, we don't care about the university thing, I care about the passion thing. So if you're, if you're programming because you're being paid for it, that's great. We prefer your programming because you love it, but that's a different thing. So. Yeah. Hmm. But there is a thing there. The Singaporean <laughs> thing is a thing. So. And I'm allowed, <laughs> apparently I'm allowed to say it. So, <laughs> um, so with your testing setup, yes. uh, how, how rigorous is it? Like, I mean, do you have tests for every sort of feature that you implement, or is it just sort of like, kind of like more of a... Uh, just to make sure that it's like a sanity check? Um, somewhere in between. I mean, the, once I, th I think a process is kind of well established and works for me, and it's like, okay, let's implement a test just to make sure I don't break it. For instance, logging in and logging out is absolutely essential if that works, right? You don't want to do something with the cookies which breaks your logging in and logging out or your payment system. Got to make sure that a couple. So, 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 so some of the things are fairly short, like can I log in or if I go to a page, can is is the login page there? But others are like let's follow a whole user story. Can the user log in, look at a document, find a word, back it out? And, and the test will very quickly tell you whether it's doing the right thing. And then you know because. 95% of the time, the tests aren't breaking, so you don't want to run lots and lots of minuscule tests. If this one big test fails, then I know I've got a problem, but that's... Uh, so it's, it's kind of a, a, it's a choice. Yeah. It works, works for me. Uh, one other question was, uh, the, you've got Happy and Express in there. Yes. Um, usually people go for one or the other. Um, I mean, was that just sort of like, if you evolved to pick Happy and you realised all was a better choice for JSON API or, or what? So you, what, what was the, what uh, So Express is running on the web server doing, it can cope with lots and lots of different things. It has to cope with authentication, lots of different issues. Happy is almost zero, that one page is a completely happy server. Mm -hmm. That I kind of liked. So just, just the efficiency of not, not having lots of choices to make is also sure. good. Right? Okay. So in, in a way just handcuffing yourself can be good things. Can you please explain how you make a caching with promises? Oh, okay, let me just. Thanks. Okay, so, what, okay, this is. So, is, the problem with all these code snippets is they're all like a lightning talk on their own. Um, basically, what Promise, that Bluebird does, is it can take an, an existing library and wrap it all. So this, this will take the file FS library and then add an async method for every method it finds, for every relevant method it finds. And instead of having a call read file with a callback at the end, it generates what's called a promise. So basically that promise will then, on, on a successful read on this read file async, it will go then. It will then implement JSON parse. And the, the output of that will have a result called p.then, which is at the bottom. So at the bottom, the p.then has a JSON parsed version of whatever is in the file. However, the way promises work, and this is the whole thing there, an attic, is that the, the catch, which is underneath there, then catch, will catch all, all the error paths will go into there. And basically this means that either the JSON, re, the JSON version failed, but more likely the file wasn't on disk. So what this then does is it returns a new promise, and the new promise is a load, does, you know, it does a load from the database, and it returns, in the res return resolve thing just resolves itself into the results of doing this from the database. <coughs> so, so the point of it, and, and also asynchronously writes the file back to disk, but I don't, I've already got the result, I don't care whether that happens right before I continue. So this, this whole kind of promise mechanism allows you to deal with the callback hell, the kind of multi-branching, all in one nice long stream, um, and and it's a thing. <laughs>
So if I, I'm just supposed to get sure, sure. the code. Uh, you don't really do caching. You just uh, you expecting that the file is there, and if it's not, right, right, right. So you expect it from the so database. But like I, I just said that you can do like have database caching. So like if I if I request something from the database, store it in a cache. Mm. I'm I'm doing I, I'm kind of assuming that's going to be cached, mm. and then failing, right? So, oh, okay. right. So like you can kind of treat file system as cache. Right, right, right. So, so, but, but this whole pro getting ahead around promises in general is something which I haven't yet completely done. Um, but it's, it's a good thing because callback hell is a node, oh, yeah. is a symptom, right? So, um. You're going to have problems if, um, if you've got, uh, on, uh, what is the line that is, if a uh, return resolved empty array, that will buy you maybe, uh, Maybe depending on what load the entity names does, but uh, I've done this kind of thing where, like, if my, if my database doesn't like know what it's doing, I'll just be like, here, I'll give you back like a sort of sensible result. Um, but then later down the track, when you thought the database will never return an error, or like, you know, this this you understand all the cases in which it will do that, and then you'll have like some horrible thing where like the disk is like you've got too many file descriptors open or something, and and the the database. Uh, thing will, will catch it, um, but you're completely ignoring it. Um, so, if there is some horrible problem here, you right. won't ever know about it. Um, well, I'll, I'll know because I haven't got any results back from the database. Sure, but yeah. you probably wouldn't look here first. You'd probably like, no, no, well, why, I, didn't why did my database not yeah, yeah, so, so. No, no, absolutely. If I was your logger, that's a warning, or put that into I, I can. I think I am actually looking as warning, but I took it out for uh, purposes okay. of like, <laughs> like squeezing it out. Right. Martin, you, you said that you um, want to do something in the style of uh, WhatsApp. Yes. Right? So why are you not relying on the open API from WhatsApp and just use WhatsApp? IBM offers it. For free, right? Yes. So, so um, why reinvent the world when these guys have done a lot? Maybe you should talk about that afterwards. Okay, well, just, just briefly, I mean, um, well, one, I would be out of a job, but also, two, the company wants to do this themselves. Okay. They actually believe that they have in IP internally, and to get the Watson team or to get, you know, a consultant who will deliver this solution externally up to speed for the same price they could have me, right, and, and own it, and then sell it. So that's that's their thinking. I mean, yes, the, the IBM Watson is is a great thing, but I, IBM's not going to give it away for free forever. Mm -hmm. I, I don't read them saying that. So. 